when I glance over my notes and records of the Sherlock Holmes cases between the years 82 and 90, I am faced by so many which present strange and interesting features that it is no easy matter to know which to choose and which to leave. Some, however, have already gained publicity through the papers, and others have not offered a field for those peculiar qualities which my friend possessed in so high a degree, and which it is the object of these papers to illustrate. Some, too, have baffled his analytical skill, and would be, as narratives, beginnings without an ending, while others have been but partially cleared up, and have their explanations founded rather upon conjecture and surmise than on that absolute logical proof which was so dear to him. There is, however, one of these last, which was so remarkable in its details, and so startling in its results, that I am tempted to give some account of it, in spite of the fact that there are points in connection with it which never have been, and probably never will be, entirely cleared up. The year 87 furnished us with a long series of cases of greater or less interest, of which I retain the records. Among my headings under this one twelve months, I find an account of the adventure of the Paradol Chamber of the Amateur Mendicant Society, who held a luxurious club in the lower vault of a furniture warehouse, of the facts connected with the loss of the British bark Sophie Anderson, of the singular adventures of the Grice Pattersons in the island of Uffa, and finally of the Camberwell poisoning case. In the latter, as may be remembered, Sherlock Holmes was able, by winding up the dead man's watch, to prove that it had been wound up two hours before, and that therefore the deceased had gone to bed within that time, a deduction which was of the greatest importance in clearing up the case. All these I may sketch out at some future date, but none of them present such singular features as the strange train of circumstances which I now have taken up my pen to describe. It was in the latter days of September, and the equinoctial gales had set in with exceptional violence. All day the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against the windows, so that even here in the heart of great handmade London we were forced to raise our minds for the instant from the routine of life and to recognize the presence of those great elemental forces which shriek at mankind through the bars of his civilization, like untamed beasts in a cage. As evening drew in, the storm grew higher and louder, and the wind cried and sobbed like a child in the chimney. Sherlock Holmes sat moodily at one side of the fireplace, cross-indexing his records of crime, while I, at the other, was deep in one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories, until the howl of the gale from without seemed to blend with the text and the splash of the rain to lengthen out into the long swash of the sea waves. My wife was on a visit to her mother's, and for a few days I was a dweller once more in my old quarters at Baker Street. Why, said I, glancing up at my companion, that was surely the bell. Who could come to-night? Some friend of yours, perhaps? Except yourself, I have none, he answered. I do not encourage visitors. A client, then? If so, it is a serious case. Nothing less would bring a man out on such a day and at such an hour. But I take it that it is more likely to be some crony of the landlady's. Sherlock Holmes was wrong in his conjecture, however, for there came a step in the passage and a tapping at the door. He stretched out his long arm to turn the lamp away from himself and towards the vacant chair upon which a newcomer must sit. Come in, said he. The man who entered was young some two and twenty at the outside, well-groomed and trimly clad, with something of refinement and delicacy in his bearing. The streaming umbrella which he held in his hand, and his long shining waterproof, told of the fierce weather through which he had come. He looked about him anxiously in the glare of the lamp, and I could see that his face was pale and his eyes heavy, like those of a man who is weighed down with some great anxiety. "'I owe you an apology,' he said raising his golden pince-nez to his eyes. I trust that I am not intruding. I fear that I have brought some traces of the storm and rain into your snug chamber. Give me your coat and umbrella, said Holmes. They may rest here or on the hook, and will be dry presently. You have come up from the south-west, I see. Yes, from Horsham. That clay and chalk mixture which I see upon your toe-caps is quite distinctive. I have come for advice. That is easily got. And help. That is not always so easy. I have heard of you, Mr. Holmes, 
I heard from Major Prendergast how you saved him in the Tankerville Club scandal. Ah, of course, he was wrongfully accused of cheating at cards. He said that you could solve anything. He said too much. That you were never beaten. I have been beaten four times, three times by men and once by a woman. But what is that compared with the number of your successes? It is true that I have been generally successful. Then you may be so with me. I beg that you will draw your chair up to the fire and favour me with some details as to your case. It is no ordinary one. None of those which come to me are. I am the last court of appeal. And yet I question, sir, whether in all your experience you have ever listened to a more mysterious and inexplicable chain of events than those which have happened in my own family. You fill me with interest, said Holmes. Pray give us the essential facts from the commencement, and I can afterwards question you as to those details which seem to me to be the most important. The young man pulled his chair up, and pushed his wet feet out towards the blaze. My name, said he, is John Openshaw, but my own affairs have, as far as I can understand, little to do with this awful business. It is a hereditary matter, so in order to give you an idea of the facts, I must go back to the commencement of the affair. You must know that my grandfather had two sons, my uncle Elias and my father Joseph. My father had a small factory at Coventry, which he enlarged at the time of the invention of bicycling. He was a patentee of the Openshaw unbreakable tyre, and his business met with such success that he was able to sell it and to retire upon a handsome competence. My uncle Elias emigrated to America when he was a young man, and became a planter in Florida, where he was reported to have done very well. At the time of the war he fought in Jackson's army, and afterwards under Hood, where he rose to be a colonel. When Lee laid down his arms, my uncle returned to his plantation, where he remained for three or four years. About 1869 or 1870 he came back to Europe and took a small estate in Sussex, near Horsham. He had made a very considerable fortune in the States, and his reason for leaving them was his aversion to the Negroes and his dislike of the Republican policy in extending the franchise to them. He was a singular man, fierce and quick-tempered, very foul-mouthed when he was angry, and of a most retiring disposition. During all the years that he lived at Horsham, I doubt if ever he set foot in the town. He had a garden and two or three fields round his house, and there he would take his exercise, though very often for weeks on end he would never leave his room. He drank a great deal of brandy, and smoked very heavily, but he would see no society, and did not want any friends, not even his own brother. He didn't mind me. In fact, he took a fancy to me, for at the time when he saw me first, I was a youngster of twelve or so. This would be in the year 1878, after he had been eight or nine years in England. He begged my father to let me live with him, and he was very kind to me in his way. When he was sober, he used to be fond of playing backgammon and draughts with me, and he would make me his representative both with the servants and with the tradespeople, so that by the time that I was sixteen I was quite master of the house. I kept all the keys, and could go where I liked, and do what I liked, so long as I did not disturb him in his privacy. There was one singular exception, however, for he had a single room, a lumber room, up among the attics, which was invariably locked, and which he would never permit either me or anyone else to enter. With a boy's curiosity I have peeped through the keyhole, but I was never able to see more than such a collection of old trunks and bundles as would be expected in such a room. One day, it was in March 1883, a letter with a foreign stamp lay upon the table in front of the colonel's plate. It was not a common thing for him to receive letters, for his bills were all paid in ready money, and he had no friends of any sort. "'From India,' said he as he took it up. "'Pondicherry postmark. What can this be?' Opening it hurriedly, out there jumped five little dried orange pips, which pattered down upon his plate. I began to laugh at this, but the laugh was struck from my lips at the sight of his face. His lip had fallen, his eyes were protruding, his skin the colour of putty, and he glared at the envelope which he still held in his trembling hand, K, 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 he shrieked, and then, My God, my God, my sins have overtaken me. What is it, uncle? I cried. Death, said he, and rising from the table he retired to his room, leaving me palpitating with horror. I took up the envelope and saw scrawled in red ink upon the inner flap, just above the gum, 
the letter K three times repeated. There was nothing else save the five dried pips. What could be the reason for his overpowering terror? I left the breakfast table, and as I ascended the stair, I met him coming down with an old rusty key, which must have belonged to the attic in one hand, and a small brass box like a cash box in the other. They may do what they like, but I'll checkmate them still, said he with an oath. Tell Mary that I shall want a fire in my room to-day, and send down to Fordham the Horsham lawyer. I did as he ordered, and when the lawyer arrived, I was asked to step up to the room. The fire was burning brightly, and in the grate there was a mass of black fluffy ashes as of burned paper, while the brass box stood open and empty beside it. As I glanced at the box, I noticed with a start that upon the lid was printed the treble K which I had read in the morning upon the envelope. "'I wish you, John,' said my uncle, "'to witness my will. I leave my estate, with all its advantages and all its disadvantages, to my brother your father, whence it will no doubt descend to you. If you can enjoy it in peace, well and good. If you find you cannot, take my advice, my boy, and leave it to your deadliest enemy.' I am sorry to give you such a two-edged thing, but I can't say what turn things are going to take. Kindly sign the paper where Mr. Fordham shows you. I signed the paper as directed, and the lawyer took it away with him. The singular incident made, as you may think, the deepest impression upon me, and I pondered over it and turned it every way in my mind without being able to make anything of it. Yet I could not shake off the vague feeling of dread which it left behind though the sensation grew less keen as the weeks passed, and nothing happened to disturb the usual routine of our lives. I could see a change in my uncle, however. He drank more than ever, and he was less inclined for any sort of society. Most of his time he would spend in his room, with the door locked upon the inside, but sometimes he would emerge in a sort of drunken frenzy and would burst out of the house and tear about the garden with a revolver in his hand, screaming out that he was afraid of no man and that he was not to be cooped up, like a sheep in a pen, by man or devil. When these hot fits were over, however, he would rush tumultuously in at the door and lock and bar it behind him, like a man who can brazen it out no longer against the terror which lies at the roots of his soul. At such times I have seen his face, even on a cold day, glisten with moisture as though it were new raised from a basin. Well, to come to an end of the matter, Mr. Holmes, and not to abuse your patience, there came a night when he made one of those drunken sallies from which he never came back. We found him when we went to search for him, face downward in a little green-scummed pool which lay at the foot of the garden. There was no sign of any violence, and the water was but two feet deep, so that the jury, having regard to his known eccentricity, brought in a verdict of suicide. But I, who knew how he winced from the very thought of death, had much ado to persuade myself that he had gone out of his way to meet it. The matter passed, however, and my father entered into possession of the estate and of some fourteen thousand pounds which lay to his credit at the bank. One moment, Holmes interposed. Your statement is, I foresee, one of the most remarkable to which I have ever listened. Let me have the date of the reception by your uncle of the letter and the date of his supposed suicide. The letter arrived on March tenth, 1883. His death was seven weeks later upon the night of May 2nd. Thank you. Pray proceed. When my father took over the Horsham property, he, at my request, made a careful examination of the attic, which had been always locked up. We found the brass box there, although its contents had been destroyed. On the inside of the cover was a paper label, with the initials of KKK repeated upon it, and letters, memoranda, receipts, and a register written beneath. These, we presume, indicated the nature of the papers which had been destroyed by Colonel Openshaw. For the rest, there was nothing of much importance in the attic, save a great many scattered papers and notebooks bearing upon my uncle's life in America. Some of them were of the wartime, and showed that he had done his duty well and had borne the repute of a brave soldier. Others were of a date during the reconstruction of the southern states, and were mostly concerned with politics for he had evidently taken a strong part in opposing the carpet-bag politicians who had been sent down from the north. Well, it was the beginning of eighty-four, when my father came to live at Horsham, and all went as well as possible with us until the January of eighty-five. 
On the fourth day after the new year, I heard my father give a sharp cry of surprise as we sat together at the breakfast table. There he was, sitting with a newly opened envelope in one hand, and five dried orange pips in the outstretched palm of the other one. He had always laughed at what he called my cock-and-bull story about the colonel, but he looked very scared and puzzled now that the same thing had come upon himself. "'Why, what on earth does this mean, John?' he stammered. My heart had turned to lead. "'It is K.K.K.,' said I. He looked inside the envelope. "'So it is,' he cried. "'Here are the very letters. But what is this written above them?' "'Put the papers on the sundial,' I read, peeping over his shoulder. "'What papers? What sundial?' he asked. "'The sundial in the garden. There is no other,' said I. "'But the papers must be those that are destroyed.' "'Pooh!' said he, gripping hard at his courage. "'We're in a civilized land here, and we can't have tomfoolery of this kind. Where does the thing come from?' "'From Dundee,' I answered, glancing at the postmark. "'Some preposterous practical joke,' said he. "'What have I to do with sundials and papers? I shall take no notice of such nonsense.' "'I should certainly speak to the police,' I said. "'And be laughed at for my pains? Nothing of the sort. "'Then let me do so? "'No, I forbid you. I won't have a fuss made about such nonsense.' "'It was in vain to argue with him, for he was a very obstinate man. "'I went about, however, with a heart which was full of forebodings. "'On the third day after the coming of the letter, "'my father went from home to visit an old friend of his, Major Freebody, who was in command of one of the ports upon Ports Down Hill. I was glad that he should go, for it seemed to me that he was farther from danger when he was away from home. In that, however, I was in error. Upon the second day of his absence, I received a telegram from the Major, imploring me to come at once. My father had fallen over one of the deep chalk pits which abound in the neighbourhood, and was lying senseless with a shattered skull. I hurried to him, but he passed away without having ever recovered his consciousness. He had, as it appears, been returning from Ferrum in the twilight, and as the country was unknown to him, and the chalk-pit unfenced, the jury had no hesitation in bringing in a verdict of death from accidental causes. Carefully as I examined every fact connected with his death, I was unable to find anything which could suggest the idea of murder. There were no signs of violence, no footmarks, no robbery— no record of strangers having been seen upon the roads? And yet I need not tell you that my mind was far from at ease, and that I was well-nigh certain that some foul plot had been woven round him. In this sinister way I came into my inheritance. You will ask me why I did not dispose of it? I answer, because I was well convinced that our troubles were in some way dependent upon an incident in my uncle's life and that the danger would be as pressing in one house as in another. It was in January 85 that my poor father met his end, and two years and eight months have elapsed since then. During that time I have lived happily at Horsham, and I had begun to hope that this curse had passed away from the family, and that it had ended with the last generation. I had begun to take comfort too soon, however. Yesterday morning— the blow fell in the very shape in which it had come upon my father. The young man took from his waistcoat a crumpled envelope, and turning to the table, he shook out upon it five little dried orange pips. This is the envelope, he continued. The postmark is London, Eastern Division. Within are the very words which were upon my father's last message. K, K, K. And then, put the papers on the sundial. "'What have you done?' asked Holmes. "'Nothing.' "'Nothing?' "'To tell the truth,' he sank his face into his thin white hands. "'I have felt helpless. "'I have felt like one of those poor rabbits "'when the snake is writhing toward it. "'I seem to be in the grasp of some resistless, inexorable evil "'which no foresight and no precautions can guard against.' "'Tut, tut!' cried Sherlock Holmes. You must act, man, or you are lost. Nothing but energy can save you. This is no time for despair. I have seen the police. Ah! But they listen to my story with a smile. I am convinced that the inspector has formed the opinion that the letters are all practical jokes, and that the deaths of my relations were really accidents, as the jury stated, 
and were not to be connected with the warnings. Holmes shook his clenched hands in the air. Incredible imbecility, he cried. They have, however, allowed me a policeman who may remain in the house with me. Has he come with you to-night? No, his orders were to stay in the house. Again Holmes raved in the air. Why did you come to me? he said. And above all, why did you not come at once? I did not know. It was only to-day that I spoke to Major Prendergast about my troubles, and was advised by him to come to you. It is really two days since you had the letter. We should have acted before this. You have no further evidence, I suppose, than that which you have placed before us, no suggestive detail which might help us? There is one thing, said John Openshaw. He rummaged in his coat pocket, and drawing out a piece of discoloured, blue-tinted paper, he laid it out upon the table. I have some remembrance said he, that on the day when my uncle burned the papers, I observed that the small unburned margins which lay amid the ashes were of this particular colour. I found this single sheet upon the floor of his room, and I am inclined to think that it may be one of the papers which has, perhaps, fluttered out from among the others, and in that way has escaped destruction. Beyond the mention of Pips, I do not see that it helps us much. I think myself that it is a page from some private diary. The writing is undoubtedly my uncle's. Holmes moved the lamp, and we both bent over the sheet of paper, which showed by its ragged edge that it had indeed been torn from a book. It was headed March 1869, and beneath were the following enigmatical notices. Fourth. Hudson came. Same old platform. Seventh. Set the pips on Macaulay, Paramore, and John Swain of St. Augustine. Ninth. Macaulay cleared. Tenth, John Swain cleared. Twelfth, visited Paramore. All well. Thank you, said Holmes, folding up the paper and returning it to our visitor. And now you must on no account lose another instant. We cannot spare time even to discuss what you have told me. You must get home instantly and act. What shall I do? There is but one thing to do. It must be done at once. You must put this piece of paper which you have shown us into the brass box which you have described. You must also put in a note to say that all the papers were burned by your uncle, and that this is the only one which remains. You must assert that in such words as will carry conviction with them. Having done this, you must at once put the box out upon the sundial as directed. Do you understand? Entirely. Do not think of revenge or anything of the sort at present. I think that we may gain that by means of the law— but we have our web to weave, while theirs is already woven. The first consideration is to remove the pressing danger which threatens you. The second is to clear up the mystery, and to punish the guilty parties. "'I thank you,' said the young man, rising and pulling on his overcoat. "'You have given me fresh life and hope. I shall certainly do as you advise. Do not lose an instant, and above all take care of yourself in the meanwhile— for I do not think that there can be a doubt that you are threatened by a very real and imminent danger. How do you go back? By train from Waterloo? It is not yet nine. The streets will be crowded. So I trust that you may be in safety. And yet you cannot guard yourself too closely. I am armed. That is well. Tomorrow I shall set to work upon your case. I shall see you at Horsham, then. No. Your secret lies in London. It is there that I shall seek it. Then I shall call upon you in a day or in two days with news as to the box and the papers. I shall take your advice in every particular. He shook hands with us and took his leave. 